Hey, Navigator Nation, how goes? How's everybody doing today? It is Monday. It is the start of a new week. It is the start of a new month. Um, lots of changes in the air right now. Uh, we just got some news about our uh, stay at home order somewhat getting lifted. We still have to be really careful with how, lo how uh, a lot of, uh, bleh, easy for me to say. A lot of our interactions with businesses and things like that are still going to be somewhat restricted. Um, and I, I have some concerns about it. I, I don't know that we're as out of the woods as we like to think we are. I'm still concerned a bit about the potential for a, a surge, a, a second wave, if you will, especially as we uh, see what happens with Memorial Day and a lot of the parties that are going on and a lot of... Uh, the other issues that are happening right now, we see a lot of people um, uh, protesting, demonstrating, not necessarily being distant um, because it's really hard to do that. So um, I just have some concerns about where we're going in the next few weeks. But uh, be that as it may, it is uh, what it is and we are where we are. So um, here we are. The flip side to that is uh, obviously it looks like uh, my usual job is going to be getting back a little bit more toward normal and I'm probably going to have to start cutting back. Uh, well, I'm definitely going to have to start cutting back um, on daily shows. Um, and uh, we're going to have to take a look and see at uh, what kind of media is going to be most helpful for everyone out there, um, whether it is these live shows, whether it is... Um, Things like uh, the the Zoom webinars, like we've got uh, coming up tonight, we're going to play some harmonicas together, get some of that uh, virtual support kind of thing going on. Uh, tonight at 7 o'clock, uh, you can hit up our uh, COPD Navigator Facebook page um, for details on that. I will actually go ahead, and if you'll give me just a moment here, we'll get some of those links ready here too. Um, will things like that be helpful? Would things be... Um, uh, things, you know, pre-recorded things, are those, are those the most helpful? What are some of the things that are the most helpful for everybody out there so that, uh, we can continue to provide really good, effective, high quality content for everybody. One thing I do also want to point, uh, point folks toward is, uh, this past Sunday, my wife, Kelly and I, um, you, many of you have seen Kelly on uh, previous shows of house call. Um, we're able to uh, launch our new uh, YouTube program uh, called uh, Fight to Flight, uh, wherein we share our experiences as uh, folks who have lived with uh, various um, um, chronic conditions, uh, diabetes, obesity, all those sorts of things, uh, as well as our journeys in advocacy and in uh, clinical education uh, to help people work on a lot of that stuff. We know that right now, Again, with a lot of stressors right now, with the pandemic, with some of the social stress that's going on right now, um, it's a really difficult time for a lot of folks who are dealing with chronic stuff. And that happens at baseline, too. We know that the healthcare system has not done a great job of... Um, supporting folks with chronic conditions, particularly those that... Um, are caused by things that don't necessarily align with um, our good values and things like that. You know, people who eat a lot, um, well, you should just stop eating. Uh, people who um, smoke, you know, people who have COPD who, who maybe got it from smoking should, shouldn't have smoked as much. Um, we know that that's very prevalent and we want to work to change that. So um, let's see. So if we go to... Uh, let's see if we can get these links ready here. Again, bearing with me for just one second. While I'm uh, chatting through all this stuff, I'll say hello to John. If you have any uh, comments, suggestions, all that stuff, make sure you're dropping them into the comment area um, while I'm getting this stuff, uh, trying to get this stuff together here. Uh, where's, why can't I click, 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 click. So... Uh, where's the link? Here we go. Finally get to the link here. We'll drop that, uh, copy that and drop it here. 
maybe. Drop it here. And we'll put a little bit more context in the uh, media link here. Let's see. Tonight, uh, virtual harmonica session. Ta-da. All right. Uh, also, hello, Michael Pascal. Michael, one of our um, stellar COPD advocates here in Kalamazoo, uh, living with the condition and also taking time to st uh, stay active. Uh, has a very active job and uh, um, is a very avid golfer. I've seen him on Instagram a time or two, uh, hitting the links as soon as that became safe. I'm sure he's using his good social distancing practices or physical distancing practices, being social from a distance. Um, Hopefully, one of these days, when we get back to normal at some point, uh, we can uh, um, actually pull off that golf outing someday. Um, we had uh, hoped to have a, a golf outing a couple of different times, and just the stars have not aligned very well. But hopefully, we'll get there eventually, and we'll make that work. So, uh, Hello to Brian, one of our patrons on Patreon. Um, if you're interested in supporting the work that uh, we're doing with COPD Navigator or with Fight the Flight, um, we've got a couple of different ways you can do that. We're looking at putting together some additional packages for those folks who support us. Um, it's a limited uh, crowd right now, so we haven't been able to put a lot of uh, interesting, engaging stuff together. But uh, Brian did end up with a... Uh, uh, somewhat inadvertent, but still a one-on-one -on -one virtual session with me last week. Um, let's go uh, come join the fun over there, and uh, we can bring back the daily shows, hopefully. We'll get enough support there. Uh, Kim checking in, also from here in Kalamazoo, also checking in on the harmonicas tonight. You know, um, we'll also have, um, if things go well, uh, my boys will be checking in. They went back to their uh, mom's house for a little bit. Uh, played this morning, Michael says. Excellent. Um, the boys, uh, as many of you who maybe tuned in last week when we did our harmonicas, uh, on house call, um, I believe that was Tuesday. We usually do that on, uh, or no, Wednesday, excuse me, harmonica Wednesday. Um, rig Tommy into doing that. Tommy is a drum major. Uh, well, is, was, we're about, to, we're about heading up on graduation here, but, uh, a uh, very avid, uh, as much as uh, Mike is an avid golfer, Tommy is an avid musician, um, trum uh, trumpeter, and uh, drum major, as I said this year. So I roped him into uh, giving us a little bit of additional context with uh, harmonica and some music theory stuff last week. Um, turns out he really enjoyed it. So uh, he and uh, his brother Joey, uh, who you may know from our Fitness Friday uh, activities as Ladderman, Still not sure how that happened, but uh, he is the ladder man. Um, they've been playing harmonicas all weekend. It's been entertaining. We've been doing a couple of different things, uh, learning how to play a little bit better. Um, at least they are. They've been self-teaching a lot of stuff. It's been really quite impressive. Um, I am continuing to be terrible, but I um, suppose that's how things go. <laughs> Uh, but they'll be joining us tonight. Kim's going to be joining us tonight. Um, hopefully, we'll see other folks here tonight. So we've got those links set up tonight, 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Um, so translate that to whatever time zone you're in. I think I saw Shar um, checking the event link on our Facebook page, which is another option for you to do. You can hit that up and uh, get reminders and stuff like that. You do not need a harmonica if you just want to come hang out and listen to us uh, uh, kick a few tunes around. That is perfectly fine, too. Um, we're also trying tomorrow, uh, we're going to do another more educational type of support group, the kind of thing that you might see in, uh, for example, like a, a Better Breathers kind of deal or something like that. Um, we're going to be talking about non-pharmacological, non-medicinal ways you can uh, uh, help improve your lung function, or not necessarily improve your lung function, but certainly improve your symptom burden and that sort of thing. Um Hopefully Brian will be there for that. We're going to talk about things like oscillatory pep, you know, some of the stuff we've covered before, but we'll be able to go in a little bit more detail with uh, with this kind of webinar format. 
Uh, then Wednesday, I actually put on my patient hat and uh, help out and my assistant hat. And I help out uh, my wife, Kelly, in her support group endeavors. Um, she runs um, a couple of different um, obesity management and pre-surgical and back on track sort of uh, um, uh, Zoom conferences for that, which kind of gave me some of the idea for uh, COPD Navigator Ready Room. And then Thursday, we'll be back with uh just having some fun we've got uh, we're going to try and do a couple of games uh, on see what we can do with that uh, hopefully have some of the uh, bugs worked out by then i'm going to try and uh, um, rope in uh, joey and tommy again um to uh, um, give me some prototype testing to begin with and we'll see if uh if that works pretty well and so hopefully we'll have all that set up by thursday and we'll have a good time Hello to Janice, checking in from Illinois over by St. Louis. Hope you're doing well. Um, if I remember that correctly, I think I'm finally starting to get my geography skills back a little bit. Um, so, like I said, that's kind of a look at what we've got uh, upcoming this week. Um, I will say that uh, as things stand right now, this is very likely the last week for uh, daily house calls. Um Unless something really significant happens or anything like that, um, we'll just have to see what happens. So uh, let me know in the comments or via email, uh, breathe TV at copdnavigator.net, um, or on Twitter or messaging on Facebook or wherever you're at. Let me know um, what, if, if we're able to do some live shows, what, uh, what times would be good? What have you enjoyed seeing us? Have you enjoyed the trivia? Have you enjoyed the nail polish stuff? Have you enjoyed the, um, uh, fitness Friday, um, lip sync for lungs? Let me know the kind of things that you want to see. Is it more educational? You want to have social stuff? Would you rather just have zoom stuff? Um, let me know. Let me know what you're thinking. I, you know, I, I, I can't tell you how fulfilling a lot of this has been. Um, being able to have this to look forward to every day and be able to, to share some time with all of you um, has been a fantastic experience. As many of you know, I've been doing um, live shows of various stripe for about uh, three years now, having run COPD Navigator for, for uh, a little over six. Um, but the, the interaction is really is really gratifying. Uh, Jeannie also coming by tonight with the harmonica. Excellent. So we're going to have a, we're gonna have a pretty good crowd. It'll be fun. Um, we'll probably got some harmonica vets. So we'll, 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 we'll still run through some of the basic shtick and then we'll see, uh, um, see what we can do. However, um, what was I saying? Uh, the, the, the live interactions to me have been incredibly gratifying, uh, and incredibly satisfying as a clinician. Um, I'm really hopeful that we're able to provide a lot of these things both unofficially, informally, like we do here, um, but also in the clinical side of things. You know, I've, I've watched uh, Kelly. She's done a lot of virtual visits. We've got a lot of uh, um, that capability in our, in our healthcare infrastructure now where we can do things online. We can, we can do things uh, uh, preferably with, with two-way communication. Sometimes it's a phone call. Um, but, uh, you know, it is what it is. We have done that out of necessity at this point because we wanted to minimize exposures. We wanted to protect everybody as best as we could. Um, but I think this has also, I hope at least, that this has made us a little bit more mindful of people who struggle with this stuff all the time. Um, you know, there are a lot of folks out there as much as we encourage people to get out and stay active and do all the stuff and, you know, engage as much as possible and everything else. There are folks for whom that is really a challenge, obviously. Um, and I want to be able to, um, bring this kind of, of, access to people on a regular basis. I think this is very necessary. I think it is very important. Um, and, you know, frankly, there are a lot of times where we do things that can be done remotely. A little bit before, um, tobacco cessation is a great example of that. Um, you know, th there's not really a need to do 
I don't need to take a blood pressure. I don't need to necessarily listen to your lungs or do a pulse ox or anything like that. I can have the conversation with you and offer what support I can and give you tips and tricks and things like that and, and advice. Um, but I don't need you to, to ride three buses to get to my office or, you know, anything like that or, or uh, you know, those, those barriers. I don't need you to take time off of work so that we can come talk about smoking for 15 minutes. I can come to you uh, virtually and provide that service. You know, there are times where um, we know, you know, you're most people out there are kind of their own best judge of, of their symptom burden and things like that. You call the office saying, hey, I think I'm starting to have a flare, starting to have an exacerbation. Um, we still make you often come into the office so that we can check all the things and look at all the things. And there's some benefit to that. Um, you know, we should, we don't want to go too far where everything is completely hands off. But if I can look at you via a webcam or what have you, and I can see how you're coughing, I can see how out of breath you are. I can have you walk around the room for a minute and see how out of breath you get. Uh, many people out there have their own oximeter. Uh, so I can have you take your own oximetry measurement. Why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't I just have you know, have that as an option and then, you know, have, a, have the office send in medications. It's just, to me, that seems like a, a better way to go about things. So I'm hopeful that we can start uh, looking at some of these things again, informally like here and formally as in um, virtual visits and all that kind of stuff. So I uh, appreciate everybody, again, stopping by, um, especially since, you know, we may now be uh, somewhat limited in the time we're going to be able to spend together. Um, so let's see. One thing I want to look at here. We're going to take a while you guys are getting thinking of any questions that you might want to throw in there. Um, I want to take a look through and uh, um, see if we've got anything new in the world of research or anything like that. Let's see. Computer is running a little bit slow today. You know, it's there have been some weird glitches. Um, if you do watch the video that Kelly and I posted, um, we did a live show just like, just like this. Same software, same setup. Everything was the same. But for some inexplicable reason um of our voices are like half an octave too low i mean it, it's it's a weird thing somehow the uh, um the the gain was wrong or something and it wasn't even the gain because it, it was weird clicks and pops and it just didn't make any sense um what was even weirder is today i went to go test everything to see you know if i could figure out what the problem was and everything was immediately fine right off the bat. So um, be aware of that if you're going to uh, to check out um, um, our video at uh, The Best Nest on YouTube um, or finding us uh, Fight to Flight is the name of the actual show. Oh, come on, why are you being goofy? COPD. So while I'm struggling with the computer, make sure you guys are getting your questions in and all that stuff here. Um, let's see. So, oh, here's uh, something interesting. What do we have here? Um, combining um, the topic of the day, COPD, with um, the elephant in the room of the old-fashioned pandemic here. And now everything has slowed to a crawl again. There we go. COPD innovation may keep COVID patients off ventilators. So we have something called the pulse hailer. Um, so the pulse hailer administers air pressure. Oh, come on. Air pressure pulsations throughout the breathing cycle, reopening closed airways and clearing mucus clogs. Uh, the non-invasive 20 minute air chopping treatment uh, can be self-administered. So um, that's interesting. 
uh, a pulse hailer. I have not uh, seen that before. So this looks to be, uh, maybe we'll have to talk about this a little bit more on the uh, the show tomorrow night. Um, looks kind of like, kind of sort of like a cough assist kind of device or um, similar to what we might do with something like this, but more active, kind of like the, uh, I'm trying to remember what that thing was called, um, that actually has a little speaker that does send so active sound waves into your lungs to help, uh, um, clear some of that stuff out. That's pretty cool, uh, innovation, but, um, this seems similar to that. Um... So that's kind of cool. And they're saying that uh, it's possible that considering the uh, similarities between COVID pneumonia and uh, chronic bronchitis types of COPD um, might be helpful with that. So, All right. Two days ago, here is a uh, Danish study. Oh, we got a comment from John here. Someone is working on a sleep monitor that uses the microphone on your smartphone uh, by actually not by actually listening, but by using sonic waves. Um, yeah, you know, that is, that's an interesting space right now, a really interesting space. I know a couple of, um, a couple of different groups. I know Dr. Uh, Maria Artendwaga's group, um, who I have had a, a consulting affiliation with in the past. So just, um, not, no compensation or anything, um, at this point, but, uh, just full disclosure, they're working on some smartphone stuff, I believe, or at least some kind of non-invasive monitor. Uh, there's another group in Israel. I'm trying to remember. I haven't heard much from them in a little while, but uh, names escaping me. I consulted with uh, them via LinkedIn a couple of times. Um, that is, I think, a little bit more um, with the recording, with the sound detection at least. So, um but only while the app app is active, you know, it listens to um, things we can't hear necessarily, some of the frequencies that we can't hear. Um, but that that can help with a lot of these things. Um, so there, and you know, uh, frankly, everybody, almost everybody's got one of these things, um, and it's a useful tool. There, the cost, much like spirometers, have have kind of dropped a little bit. Um, doing a, a trying to get a talk on spirometry done, but I uh, got stuck with the uh, that weird voice thing happened on the the recording for that too. In any event, a lot of the costs have come down. They're very accessible. They're very available. You are probably already have one. Um, so why not use the technology that's in place? We can use uh, um, artificial intelligence and machine learning and all that kind of stuff. Why not? Um, seems good to me. Interesting space. Um, so let's see, we've got, um, this study that was published, uh, supposedly a couple of days ago, yesterday or two days ago, Saturday, Danish investigators reviewed data of individuals who are prescribed corticosteroids, inhaled corticosteroids for COPD, um, to compare characteristics of patients who have COPD alone with those who have COPD and concomitant asthma. So we're kind of looking back at the, um, asthma COPD overlap. I know that's a controversial topic. Uh, it's uh, a lot of people think it's a thing. A lot of people don't think it's a thing. Gold and Gina keep going back and forth about whether it's a thing or not. But uh, this study purports to look at some characteristics there. Um, so interestingly enough, this was a study that was published in the International Journal of Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease. Uh, assuming that the use of inhaled corticosteroids uh, seems to indicate. No, nope, that's not it. Okay. I thought it was maybe they were assuming that if you had an inhaled corticosteroid, you had asthma. But uh, looks like in this summary, I'm not sure how they separated them out. Um, but they did find, I wonder, uh, see if I can maybe pull up the, that link real quick and see if I can get a little bit more detail, um, while I'm looking at the rest of the review here. Um, so according to this study, if you have been diagnosed with COPD and asthma, those folks tended to be younger, um, 
have more preserved lung function and more likely to be diagnosed with depression compared to those who have COPD alone. So, um, yeah, I'll be interested to see. Um, all right, I'm going to have to copy and paste something else here. I'll be interested to see how they look at some of the confounding factors there because some of that makes sense and some of it doesn't. It makes sense that... Um, makes sense that um, people are younger. I mean, you know, if you have asthma, that tends to be more of a disease of youth, as, uh, as it's sometimes called. It pops up a little bit earlier. Um, so let's see. Now I've actually found the, the actual survey or the actual study. I'll see if I can even pull up the, put it in the window if anybody is super interested in... Um, analyzing part of it with me. Oh, it's still all shrunk down from the harmonicas the other day. Open that up a little bit. And there we go. So it's an open access journal, um, free to uh, free to look at, free to find. Um, So getting back to the actual study. Um, so they found they went with 144 general practitioners. So these are primary care providers. Recruited patients with COPD, currently prescribed inhaled steroids, um, if available. Let's see. Oh, so all this stuff, demographics, smoking habits, all that stuff. Um, so they were able to recruit a little over 2,200 or a little under 2,300 COPD patients on ICS. Um, here we go. Let's, uh, let's see if we can look at the full article here. Uh, welcome in Bob Subkobiak from down in Florida and Daniel Shore from the great state of Texas, the Lone Star State. I hope to eventually get back down there. Hopefully we're going to be doing a talk again at some point. Uh, once, uh, conferences start up again and all that stuff. I uh, hope you gentlemen are doing well. Um, is waiting on this article to load here. Uh, hopefully it doesn't mean that the whole system's crashing around my ears. Everything still seems to be streaming at least, so that's got that going for us. Should have just downloaded the article, I guess. There we go. Uh, full text here. All right. So we found that, again, we've got uh, just under 2,300 folks. Um, how did they sort them out? Selection process. Here we go. Got a nice little flow chart here. Um, well, that's kind of a terrible flow chart. Didn't actually tell us how they selected the people who had asthma and COPD at the same time. So, okay, so here we go. Um, and having trouble scrolling again, so yeah, great start. Uh, based on the baseline characteristics, so how did they, maybe this chart will tell us. Nope, those are the baseline characteristics after they were sorted into the group that had COPD. Okay, so I guess it really just comes down as um, 540 were classified by the general practitioner as having asthma. So um, i a little disappointed that they don't go into more detail about how... Um, they figured it out. Maybe they didn't figure it out. Maybe they're just assuming that they had asthma. Um, but those folks did tend to be um, younger, according to the discussion here. Um, where to go? Higher uh, mean uh, blood eosinophil count. 
Present study found that COPD patients with concomitant asthma and on average higher mean blood eosinophil count had a lower exacerbation rate compared to patients with COPD alone um, and a lower blood eosinophil count indicating ICS is more beneficial in the COPD with asthma group. Okay, well, yeah, that, may, that makes sense. Um, because if you're having, if you... If you're on the extra treatment, then you're probably going to have fewer exacerbations. Um, if, yeah, if you have the high eosinophil count. So this study is kind of, maybe it's just that, that I've just read it right now and I need to read through it a couple more times, but um, seems a little bit splitting hairs or, I mean, um, so here's strengths of the study. We included a large cohort based on real world population. That's, yeah, that's true. It's 2000 people. That's pretty good. Um, day to day clinical visits, plenty of data was available from the cohort. Um, at first sight makes it exceptionally relevant and finding significant differences between the subset. So good for phenotyping. Uh, they do emphasize some, limitations this will be interesting the study presented here might resemble random significant associations between clinical variables and characteristics i don't think that's true i think it's just i don't think i don't think they're random that, that makes sense to me for the most part um it does say that significant association between depression and asthma so that kind of makes sense to a degree um depending on how you look at it i mean if folks are they're looking at being younger and also having depression, you know, it could be that, um, it's a, maybe it sounds weird, but maybe the older you get, the more you get used to it or something like that. I don't know. Um, so, but we know that, uh, that is, uh, depression is a, a big deal in COPD and it makes sense that it would be in COPD and asthma too. So an interesting study. Um, what else we have? So September, Dan, we're, we're still optimistically planning on September. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I've seen some places have canceled some stuff for September. Hopefully we're going to be able to stick with that. Always love to go back to Texas. And actually Texas is where I got my start with speaking. They were the first uh, society, the first respiratory society that, um, took a chance on me as a, as a speaker. So I'm really looking forward to getting back down there and uh, participating in what promises to be an excellent conference. Uh, also, Arizona checking in. Welcome, Stacy. Um, never been to Arizona. That's on the on the list. Uh, I'd like to go there. Uh, some good friends, uh, friends of Navigator, Jim and Mary Nelson, spend some time between Arizona and Colorado. Um, do enjoy uh, Colorado. Went there for the first time last year. Colorado was fun, but never been to Arizona, so... Um, what else we have? Very few patients had information on CAT score, which may have been made it difficult to demonstrate genuinely significant difference in symptoms. Um, so yeah, there's, there's some confounding factors in here. Um, but again, kind of a good, a good idea to, uh, um, you know, the, the more data, the better, I suppose, uh, in a lot of these cases. So, uh, welcome in Catherine. We've still got uh, a few minutes left. Well, we still have uh, several minutes left to uh, get some questions in there. So uh, make sure that you are chatting around here. We're just going through some various news items. Uh, here's another one. Uh, let's see a press release here. Uh, what do we have? Uh, rem This one I'm a little bit concerned about. We're talking to get into, oh, yeah, especially when we're talking about stem cells and things like that. This is always dicey um, because stem cells tend to, you know, th there's that saying in uh, um, that you should always under promise and over deliver and stem cells tend to do the exact opposite of that. Um, you know, there are companies out there that don't really have any qualms about uh um, making grand promises and not really delivering upon them. So, um, this is looking, uh, I guess I should have, uh, as I was reading the headline, it didn't occur to me until after I clicked on it. Rema stem cell L rem remes stem cell. So yeah, this is mesenteric stem cells. I believe these are usually the ones that they pull out of your belly and do washing and things like that. Um, supposedly 
uh, help with uh, C-reactive protein levels um, in COPD. I'm not optimistic, but um, let's see. Ah, here's another interesting one. Now, here is here's one that's actually good because we got some outcomes we can look at. Um, so this is another study. It looks like it comes out of the Netherlands. Patients with COPD given bronchoscopic lung volume reduction have higher median survival. So what that means, you undergo the procedure. You, you have a bronchoscopic lung volume reduction process. Let's see, what are we talking about with? Are we doing valves or are we doing coils here? Oh, uh, Let's see. Oh, we've got both. Okay. So we've got 175 uh, patients were selected for endobronchial valves, 93 patients for the coils, uh, three patients for the bypass stents, which I haven't really looked into much, uh, nine patients for polymeric lung volume reduction, which I believe is the crazy glue, uh, and two patients for pneumostoma. So I have not dealt with that one at all. That's, that's an interesting... Uh, that's an interesting one. Um, so uh, in those groups, uh, they were selected. Those who were selected for bronchoscopic lung volume reduction were younger compared to those who are not. <laughs> By four years, that's a lot. Um, Bronchos, to me, and, and again, I'm not uh, not, an interve- interve- yeah. not an English speaker apparently either. Um, I'm not an um, interventional pulmonologist, so I can't say for sure. But it seems like the vast majority of these therapies are still quite accessible for um, people of higher age. I don't think we should be necessarily restricting that as much. Um, Lower force expiratory volume. Yeah, that makes sense. Higher residual volume. That makes sense. Um, Why would they be ineligible? Absence of a suitable target lobe for treatment. Fair. Fair. Uh, unsuitable disease phenotype for a treatment, such as having chronic bronchitis, frequent exacerbations, or asthma. That kind of makes sense, too. Um, lung volume reduction works best for emphysemic-type damage, where you have a big chunk of sick lung uh, compressing healthier lung on uh, insufficient hyperinflation of the lung. So there you go. Um the patient selected for bronchoscopic lung volume reduction, uh, f- significantly fewer comorbidities than those who are referred but unsuitable for treatment. Again, that kind of makes sense. Um, the more complex your case, the more reluctant your practitioner might be to uh, to do that. But uh, um, now this is kind of an odd thing to say. 85% of their patient survival status could not be verified uh, but the overall median survival was 2,316 days. So I'm not sure um, how they're getting that data if they're not verifying it. Uh, patients invited for consultation that did not receive BLVR had a median survival of 25-24. Um, and finally, those who actually got the treatment lived longest than those who did not. Uh, 3,000 days, so that's uh, not quite 10 years, about nine years, I guess, uh, versus uh, back of the envelope math, that's uh, about two-thirds of that long, so that would be seven, six years. Cool. So this uh, this does seem to, however, they do caveat it with, because only a small proportion of patients referred for bron- uh, bronchoscopic lung volume reduction are eligible, their findings indicate a need for the development of new therapies as well as better referral tools. And yes, that that I agree with too. Um, we talked about this a little bit. Um, I did a webinar for um, Olympus a few weeks, uh, a few months back, um, for which I did receive some compensation, uh, full disclosure again. Um, but part of the, the upshot to that was that this was actually to their internal sales team, so we weren't trying to like sell it to anybody. Um, part of the upshot of the data that they had also also from a study in the Netherlands probably related to this group I haven't looked at the authors yet but um, a lot of the outside clinics didn't do a really good job with their pulmonary function testing so they would do the test and then refer them to the bronchoscopic center and then bronchoscopic center would be like eh, they didn't do the test right um, 
And there were some of the flip side to that, too, where the person ended up making their way to the center anyway, got a nut retested. It turns out, excuse me, they should have been referred. So we're still not doing a great job with um, making sure that we've we've got good, accurate, high quality pulmonary function testing to do this, uh, which is likely also affecting our outcomes. Um, Daniel asks, have you seen good results from LVVR, uh, LVR surgeries? I have not, but the amount I have seen is very low. Um, I have seen virtually, no, I haven't seen any in real life. I've got a couple of people in the group that have, uh, mentioned coils and valves and stuff like that. Uh, mostly the valves, I think. Um, and people seem pretty satisfied with it, but, um, not enough that I would feel comfortable saying, you know, yes, I've seen good results. I mean, a handful. Um, so I can't really speak to that myself. I, from a, um, logic standpoint, I, I th would generally think that the more we do, the better we're going to get at it. And I have a lot of optimism for it because it's a good process. It's, it's minimally invasive. I, I mean, technically non-invasive because there's already a conduit there, but I look at that as minimally invasive myself. Um, I know it's probably not the right, you know, medical terminology, but practical matters try to win sometimes. Um, fewer, generally fewer complications. If you are careful with the immediate follow-up, I know I've gone to a couple talks by Dr. Gerald Kreiner, uh, who does a ton of these things out at Temple. Um, they've adjusted some of their policies, their, their follow-up policies a little bit because their biggest complication was uh, pneumothorax, where you actually get air into the, the lung space there because there's usually a rupture of some kind. Um, but by keeping people, I, I think they kept them in the hospital like an extra 36 hours-ish on average that seemed to have a really big difference in their in their um, complication rate because they were able to, if they started seeing things happening, they were able to identify them faster, get treatment faster, um, and try to prevent them better overall. So again, I haven't seen enough to really make a good decision about that, um, but I, I have a lot of hope for it. Uh, Catherine asks, what's the lifespan? Uh, again, that's the, uh, the, we'll go back and look at the, try to do the math all together here. Um, the people who lived the longest were those who were referred and received the bronchoscopic lung volume reduction, um, by about a thousand days. So that's pretty good. Um, for those who were, uh, referred, but not invited for consultation, uh, there was only, um, about six years. Uh, patients invited for consultation but didn't end up receiving it had um, pretty good survival, uh, maybe within a, uh, about a year and a half of the actual intervention. So um, I would be curious to know what the confounding factor there is. If they ended up getting the consult for the procedure but not actually getting it, did they then get more intense care uh, simply by virtue of having been having access to us to a specialty center um that's an interesting thought i'd be curious to know if they looked at that um at all so i uh, got about 10 minutes left folks so let's uh we'll see if we can find one more article here um interestingly we've got a couple of things popping out here i guess now technically um ats is over the american thoracic society the annual meeting was a couple weeks ago what would have been a couple of weeks ago um, so now we've got some things that are a little bit less embargoed, I guess. Um, so we're starting to see a little bit more news. Um, let's see. What's this here from Everyday Health check, Health Checklists and Resources um, for Living with COPD During the Pandemic? So that's interesting. How can it affect it? Well, it would make it bad. Um a study of patients published back in March found that COPD was associated with a greater risk of admission to an ICU, being put on a ventilator, and dying. So again, uh, be very careful, uh, those of you in the COPD community. Um, wash your hands, wear your masks, be distant, shelter in place. Uh, sounds good. Um, not any changes to formal treatment guidelines.
So this is an okay article. Kind of a summary of a lot of other stuff. Some links to some other good stuff like COPD Foundation. Maybe trying to meditate a little bit. Uh, be mindful. We've talked about that on Fitness Friday a couple of times. Um, ah, here we go. We are talking about telehealth earlier. Um, follow state guidance on going out. Important to seek in-person care when necessary. Absolutely. But if you, ca if you can substitute a virtual visit, do so, especially if you live in an area that has a lot of active COVID-19 cases. Um, although doctor's offices are taking precautions to prevent the spread of the virus, an in-person visit still carries more risk. Yes, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, if you can, the whole idea is to minimize your risk. I mean, we have no idea if we're going to get the vaccine. We have no idea how long we're going to be dealing with this thing. It's probably going to be a while. Um, so mitigation and reducing your risk is the biggest uh, biggest goal here. So uh, decent enough article from Everyday Health. Nothing too revolutionary or revelatory, but certainly not terrible. Not the worst article I have seen um, even in the last month or so. Ah, here's a good one that we'll probably end up ending on unless we get a couple more questions here. Cognitive behavioral therapy produced small but significant reductions in COPD symptom burden as well as improved exercise capacity and quality of life. So what they did here was um, did a little bit of cognitive behavioral therapy. I wanted to see if they actually did something specific. Basically, we're looking at trying to do things to um, reduce anxiety. Um, so again, we're looking at probably some mindfulness stuff. We're looking at uh, meditation. Um, well, let's see, what would we really consider um, in this? Oops, in this application? What we're, let me get see if I can pull up a kind of a broader range of what is cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, see if I can explain it a little bit better. Uh, basically, talk therapy. Um, working with uh, somebody like a, a psychotherapist. This is from Mayo Clinic. Um, talking uh, to a mental health counselor or, or a therapist in a structured way, um, becoming aware of inaccurate or negative thinking so you can view challenging situations more clearly and respond to them in a more effective way. So um, don't they don't really talk about specific techniques here, but probably things like Instead of, you know, getting short of breath and panicking, recognizing that, okay, I'm short of breath. Now I need to do X, Y, and Z. I need to, you know, proceed carefully. I need to, I can do this. I need to do my personal breathing. I need to, you know, do these other behaviors. So um, can be done, uh, according to this, occasionally over the phone or via telemedicine. Um, and generally about a week, generally about 60 minutes. Um, so this is kind of an add-on in certain ways to um, pulmonary rehab. So this is an interesting thing. This gets me thinking a little bit about other stuff we can do um, for telehealth. So cool. Um, we will definitely talk more about um, things like cognitive behavioral therapy, um, and, um, mindfulness and, um, meditation and breathing techniques and all that stuff, um, going forward in whatever, however house call looks going forward, we will definitely be continuing to cover topics like that. Um, they are absolutely essential. Um, I would be interested in getting back to the idea of having kind of a, uh, lesson plan for the day, like, like we would do with breathe TV, um, Maybe uh, maybe that's another way we can get some some votes going here. Well, what do we like better? Do we like Breathe TV or we like House Call? Uh, as a name, uh, what's catchier? <laughs> I always like to include include people because as we talk about on Fight to Flight, as we've talked in the group many times, um, I can't fix problems if I don't know what they are. I can't help if I don't know what the issue is. You know, it, 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 we we talk about it in smoking cessation. We talk about it in why don't people use their inhalers? Um, you know, that, that's a, that's a thing. Um, we don't know if we assume we know, then we usually end up answering the, the wrong question. Um, so, 
Um, hopefully we can figure out at some point uh, how to ask the right questions a little bit better. That would be nice. Got one vote for house call already. Thank you, Ghost. Need to make that screen bigger. Um, thank you, Ghost, checking in from YouTube. So, yeah, we're going to be continuing on with, uh, as I said, we're, we're going to be talking about these things. Whatever venue we have, whatever frequency we have, we're going to continue the discussion about things like cognitive behavioral therapy. We're going to be talking about things like mindfulness. We're going to be talking about how um, to make sure that you are at your optimal level of symptoms and whatever we can do to help you um, be your best advocate and all the things that we always talk about. So that level of care isn't going anywhere, even as we start getting back into uh, whatever our new normal looks like. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, uh, spending a lot of that time with you as well. Like I said, I really look forward, really appreciated um, having these visits, having these times, uh, this this hour a day in the weekdays. Um, it has helped, uh, helped me get through the pandemic. Uh, hopefully it has helped you a little bit too. And I think, uh, I know I've learned a lot along the way um about uh, from the technical side and just you know what what can we do as clinicians to help the people in our care so i want that to continue no matter what i want to uh, give everybody out there watching the, the tools that they need that they want that we can uh, work together to improve copd care improve asthma care um working with uh, it is cathartic john absolutely that that's a great word for it um, and, uh, frankly, I'm going to miss it when we're not doing it every day. So I want to, um, I want to try to figure out a way that we can do this every day, um, even with the day job or, or something like that. So, um, I'm going to, I want to continue to stay as active as I can with a lot of these different, uh, these different things. Um, so again, trying to figure out whether it's the zoom stuff, whether it's, um, um, things like this house call. Um, I want to make sure that it is uh, free and accessible as much as possible to everybody. Um, and, uh, so that, that's my mission coming up. Um, thank you, John. Um, my, my, I, in a perfect world, um, I'll hit the lottery tomorrow and we'll just do this all the time. We'll, we'll do three hours a day, um, so that everybody can join in. But, um, Keep your fingers crossed, I guess. So, um, all right. So, with all that said, we're gonna, we, we've hit the top of the hour. Um, as part one of the things that we discussed on um, the oddly low pitched fight to flight, Kelly and I are trying to make some more positive changes um, in our health. Uh, you know, as many of you know, we have both struggled with weight our entire lives and a lot of other chronic conditions and, and stuff like that. Um, we've both had bariatric surgery, which was quite successful for both of us, but. Uh, being human as we all are, we have both kind of fallen off the wagon a little bit, so to speak, and um, uh, looking at making some healthier changes. As part of that, we're uh, trying to make uh, walk five miles, whether it's in one chunk or broken up, um, five miles a day, and it is about time for that walk. So um, again, we've got the uh, back in both of these threads here and on our COPD Navigator Facebook page. Um, you can find a link to the Zoom harmonica session tonight, 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Um, don't need a harmonica to join. Um, let's just have some fun. Let's keep uh, keep the catharsis going and uh, have some fun together playing harmonica. So, um. Unless something really weird happens, I do plan to be back tomorrow uh, at four for another um, edition of House Call. Again, let me know um, what kind of things you like to see. What I, I would really like to hear what have been some of your favorite House Call moments as we start uh, start getting ready to wrap things up, um, because those are the things I want to focus on going forward. You know, I want to have educational stuff, but I also want to put smiles on faces. Uh, I know. Again, living with experience, not of COPD, but um, of other stuff. I know chronic conditions are not a lot of fun many times. And so whatever I can do to brighten the day and things like that, that's the kind of stuff I want to do. So let me know what some of your favorite moments are. That's what I want to get, uh, what I'm going to want to focus on going forward. Um, make sure if you would, please, please, please like, share, and subscribe us uh, on Facebook on YouTube, on Twitter, uh, patreon.com slash bestnest. Um, 
you can, uh, you know, these are all different ways that you can support us um, and uh, continue to allow uh, both myself with COPD Navigator and me and my wife with uh, Fight to Flight uh, continue to help us help as many people as we possibly can uh, to get uh, get a lot of that stuff going out there and to um, help spread the word about COPD. I know that's probably weird to say in this setting, but there's still a lot of people out there who don't get it, who don't understand it, and who need to, uh, both the civilian population and clinicians, quite frankly. Um, and I want to continue doing that, um, what I feel is that valuable work. Um, yeah, so... All that said, I uh, hope to see everybody back again tomorrow. Um, uh, let me know what uh, what you might like to see. Tomorrow is usually either our uh, Trivia Tuesday or a Hollow Taco Tuesday. I do kind of need the old makeover again, uh, so we might be able to get that going. Um, tomorrow will also be our next uh, uh, Ready Room um, after the harmonicas. Uh, tomorrow will actually be the educational session where we're going to be talking about uh, um, non-medical, non-medicine stuff. Um, and uh, we'll see what else we can do. Um, so I hope everybody, uh, again, first off, I, I really want to say thank you for spending uh, part of your day today and parts of your days for the past um, two months now two and a half months, three months to go back and uh, look at our old shows, which are all available on our YouTube channel, COPD Navigator. Um, like I said, let me know what some of your, what some of our greatest hits were, if we, if we have any, hopefully we had some, I know I've had some, some, some really fun times doing these. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll see what we can do to close out the week. Um, and, uh, have some fun with house calls. So until tomorrow, uh, or until, uh, seven o'clock Eastern, uh, if you're coming to the harmonica thing, Hey Joe, um, Joe Walsh checking in again, another, uh, frequent friend of navigator, part of navigator nation. I uh, hope you're having a good day, Joe. I uh, hope everybody else is having a great day too. Hope you continue to take care of yourselves and take care of each other. And I hope you continue to breathe lightly. So until I see you again, my name is Mike Hess. I am the COPD dude. This has been COPD Navigator House Call. Take care.